It's now about three weeks since I completed the Canning Stock Route expedition. And I'm out camping again. Mainly because I've just spent the last three plus more weeks editing the programs and episode eight I finished a couple of days ago and I'm now camping. I'm now camping on my own. And the main reason why I've taken this short trip is to be able to reflect on the Land Cruiser and because while I was there, I was so excited about the place I was. I was so excited about the truck and I wanted it to kind of be able to take a step back, look at it soberly and say, what works? What shone? What is a bit, uh, would I do differently? I can't think of anything that's really disappointed me, but uh, that thought process actually started while I was on the canning where we were camped on an ancient riverbed, uh, lake bed, uh, under some trees. I took delivery of the vehicle in, uh, I think it was February. So, that's the gorgeous bit. And this is the old-fashioned bit. And started the, the build. It's my birthday. Well, it isn't really, but it looks like it. And troop carriers, as they're delivered, are very, very plain, boring, dull vehicles. So right now, part of me is in love with my new truck and part of me is smarting at the fact that I've spent so much money for what is really a van. But what I regard as a perfect platform for an overland truck. And, and I put all my efforts and with the help of a number of significant people uh, have built a truck that I am I, I'm very proud of. Some of you may ask, is it better than my previous troop carrier? Well, the answer is, oh yes. And the reason why I'm proud of it is that it, while there are things to fiddle with, while there are things to get right inside the vehicle in terms of a camping environment, ease and simplicity, the truck as it stands, as it runs now, is phenomenal. It's phenomenally good. The idea behind the Hercules conversion is that I want to turn the vehicle into a camper, which means you can live in it and out of it. And it's as simple as that to erect. I have a shade awning if I want to use it out the back. I can climb in on the outside like a traditional rooftop tent, but why would I do that? Because I can climb into it from inside. What I feel makes this particular product stand apart from almost any other similar products on the market in the world today is basically this. There is my bed. And it's already made. It's ready for me to just climb up and sleep in. I don't have to assemble cushions. I don't have to find a place for cushions to stack them when packing the vehicle. All I do is I drop this like this. I climb out and I close the roof. That's it. I can leave my bedding up here as long as it's not too thick. I've got two pillows. I take one of them down. But apart from that, it all fits. And the beauty is it all fits when it's closed. So I don't have bedding filling up the back of my truck, except for a sleeping bag. I do have one sleeping bag up there. The second one doesn't fit. What, I'm going to come up with a few ideas. What is great about the vehicle? What has really, really worked? And the two things that, I, that come to mind firstly is the hot water shower system. Four days on the road, time for a shower. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the discussion of what is the best way of warming up water and having a shower in an overland vehicle, discussion over. I've used a lot. Nothing comes even close to what I'm going to show you now. Firstly, we have 
quick pitch campers, quick on sweet. I now have privacy. Done. How long did that take? I didn't time it. I unzip it from here to go inside. I open my side flap and in it I have controls for a light and my pump selection. The pump selection basically I can choose between water source, tank in the car, water source, bucket outside. I just make my selection. What water do I want to use? So I'm at, if I'm at a well or something like that, I just scoop up some water and use the well water. If I'm not, I use the tank water. And secondly, the switch for the pump. But this isn't the good bit. Inside the vehicle, there is a 10 liter electric powered boiler. I turn it on about half an hour before I'm due to arrive at my campsite. So while the engine is running, it will warm up the water. It uses approximately 20 amps for 30 minutes in total, 10 amps from your battery to warm up 10 liters of water. And down here, there is a temperature sensitive valve. And what that does is it combines the water from the boiler and the source water, which in this case is my barrel, or I could switch it over to the onboard tank, and it calculates the temperature absolutely perfectly. Gone are fiddling with knobs. Gone is trying to mix cold with warm to try and get the right temperature. It's over. You never have to do that again. Once you have set that to a comfortable temperature, the geezer will heat the water up to 70 degrees, and the valve will mix the water with cold water and warm water to get exactly the right temperature, which means the temperature of the water is consistent and you never waste any water getting it right. So I can have a really good bush shower and I'll use four or five liters of water and that's all I'll use because there's no wastage. There's the opening for the shower. It's zipped into the ensuite and I'm now ready for my shower. Here is where the beauty of the system lies. I've selected whether I want tank or bucket and I turn on the pump. Every drop of water coming out of that rose is at exactly 70 degrees. If it's not at 70 degrees, the valve just doesn't let it through the system. The hot water system is, in terms of a you know, hassle factor, it's, a, it's a, a zero hassle factor. It is so quick that it's just it's done. It, you know, and most hot water, water systems for vehicles on this, in this size vehicles, there is quite a high and sometimes an exceptionally high hassle factor in having a shower. This is ridiculously low. So the shower system to me is a, is a, is, I like a shower when I'm on a trail and I'm happy to go two days, but by the third day, if it's a hot trail and we're working hard and, you know, I'm very active and, you know, during the day, I mean, we are, you know, when we do these trails and then I need a, I need a freshen up. I really do need to freshen up. I start to not like myself very much after a period of time. I need a shower. I built a shower into this vehicle. I built a shower into other vehicles and none of them have been a great success and this one is an enormous success. So that's the first thing that is really working beautifully. And the other thing that stands out as being a huge success are the Old Man EMU BP51 shock absorbers. I put them in the vehicle and I've, we, we, I've been tweaking them. You can tweak the rebound and the compression and I've been tweaking them and this thing, this vehicle is superb. So now Paul's been driving and he suddenly had this idea that 
the rebound on the front shocks is still too still too um, soft okay now learning about my truck in that the ride driving up here here has been a bit uh, it's a bit rough it's a, it's a bit hard it's not it's not it's, not, it's lost its and that's because we set the shock absorbers on a fairly high compression and high rebound rates and thinking about how much I'm carrying um, I'm about a hundred and fifty to two hundred kilograms less weight now in the vehicle than I had on the canning stock route which means well I can change it can't I okay so now difficult to see under here is the compression that's marked there I'm going to soften that up a little bit and I'm going to need two hands to do it because as I've put the camera down so I can't show it to you that's my setting which is quite soft, soft on both it's 0.3 near the bottom on both compression and rebound and I'll do that other shock absorber will give it the same treatment and try not to get oil from my reusable shackles on the fronts are a little easier in that I can get to them there's the adjustment there. Uh, just the, the fronts are quite hard, as you can see, the measurement there. Uh, sorry, need two hands for this. In case you're wondering what these are, these are multi-purpose mats that I use for anything from showering, standing on while I shower, working underneath the vehicle, uh, so you could even lie on them, and in this case, just staying out of the dirt to uh, make these adjustments. The uh, the bin at the back of the vehicle is a uh, product from Camp Cover. They've just come to Australia now, and um, it's one of the. I know I'm battling with the zip. It's one of the best wheel cover bins I've ever seen. Actually, by a long, it's actually the best I've ever seen, by, by actually quite a long way. And um, they've just been introduced into Australia now, and uh, it's extremely strong, and you can actually use it for carrying very heavy loads because the weight is distributed over the entire top of the wheel, not through just a few straps. And a lot of them you'll just see something over the top here and just straps. And where the straps attach, fatigues very quickly so all they are good for generally speaking is for rubbish because rubbish really gets very heavy okay this you can put heavy stuff in it cooking grids and and actually meaningful stuff that is dirty that you want to keep out of the vehicle and that's what you can put in here it's ride is brilliant and I'm talking not only on the open road fast blacktop it, it's comfortable, it's first class, and yet fully laid on these rough tracks, tough going. Man, it's good. I know this might sound as if I'm sucking up to ARB, but what do you do when you, th when you, when you come across a product in my situation and you say, wow, this is so good. Well, if I tell everybody it's so good, people will just say, oh, they, you know, it, just is sponsor, it is a sponsored unit. It's sponsored for a review. That's why they gave it to me. You know, uh, motoring journalists don't get given a car or they don't have to buy the car to do a review on it. They get given it, loaned it for a while, and then they give it back. In my case, they give me the kit, I test it, I talk about it. The ride of this is, is much better than my previous troop carrier. My previous troop carrier, I had EFS springs. They were good and uh, EFS shocks and I also had um, XJS which are the TJM shocks. The combination worked well. It's not as good as this. No way Jose. This is phenomenal. Other parts of the vehicle that work so well, the electrical system. I have two separate electrical systems yeah, in sorry. the Land Cruiser. Uh, the first system was built into the vehicle as we assembled the interior. It consists of 
two 70 amp lead crystal batteries with a DC to DC charger. DC to DC basically means simply that the car's own battery, once it's charged, will then feed the secondary battery system. Direct current to direct current. It is a high-tech system. It is, in the case of this vehicle, quite sophisticated, but not overly digitized. I don't, for example, have a digital light system where at the back of the car I can conveniently switch any light on or off of the whole vehicle. I was offered such a thing and I said absolutely not. What's wrong with a switch? Far more reliable and simple to fault trace should there be a problem. And that is a traditional vehicle battery system. It's permanently mounted in the vehicle. I have a solar panel on my roof rack which feeds into that system without me having to plug it in or plug it out, switch it on. It's all automated and some of the modern systems are automated. You literally, it's plug and play, but it's not unplug. It's a permanent installation. There is an alternative to that and I've got one here. It's called a solar pod. Now, basically what the solar pod is, is a built-in battery. This particular one has an 80 amp battery and a built-in inverter giving me 220 volts suitable for charging uh, my, my camera batteries, computer batteries, and um, can run anything up to 1 kilowatts, 1000 watts, which is significant. I have nothing on board this vehicle that will draw anything close to that. And I have USB outputs, and doesn't it look nice? Now, here's the thing. It is possible that if you had an application where you needed 220 volts, you needed your auxiliary battery system to be portable, in other words, a plug, true plug and play, take it out of the vehicle when you need it for something else, no matter what it could be, uh, even a backup system at home for power cuts. Take it out of the vehicle, unplug it, take it inside, plug it in, and boom, you've got a power system. And that's the idea of the solar pod. It is fully self-contained. And all I'm doing here is every three days I plug it. This is a DC to DC charger that is running from my auxiliary battery system permanently mounted in my vehicle and then charges this by that. I plug it in and I forget about it. And after the day's drive, this is well charged and charging. I'm using this for charging all my camera batteries and computer batteries and it'll last for many, many, many days with just one charge. So this is a, tr a real alternative. If you, you see, the thing is that an installation in a vehicle by its nature is expensive because there's quite a bit of labor involved. There, here, there's no, there's very little labor, labor involved. You can do it all yourself. One thing I should say though, is that when making your plugs, use very high quality um, Anderson type plugs. You're talking about quite high currents and make sure your wiring is very neat, but it's really is, that's all you'll have to do. Run a, a battery, a cable from your battery with one of those, you plug this in when you want to charge it and boom. It also comes with a solar panel. So you plug in whatever you want your charge device to be. For example, at home, you can charge it from 220. It has a 220 charger. Out here, I can so charge it from the vehicle, from DC to DC, or solar panel. With the solar pod, came this 120 watt flexible solar panel. It folds up into a very, very neat briefcase. It's very lightweight and very efficient for its size. Now, the trouble is that when, if you fit a solar panel to the roof of your vehicle, like we've done here, then you've got to be parked in an optimum position, pointing in the right way, to get much out of that panel. So my idea is to actually carry two one on the roof, one flexible that can be moved outside. So for example, now this, we don't have a lot of really direct sunlight, but we do have some. And now I can use this panel as opposed to that panel and recharge my batteries. If I was sitting in a situation where the vehicle was pointing perfectly, then I could use both if I was short of current. The combination of the two gives me the most versatility and flexibility when I need to 
recharge my batteries from solar. I just plug it in and it charges. And I, there are my outputs there and there, and that's a 12 volt output. And it's as simple as that. I've mounted it in the vehicle very, very securely. And that is absolutely vital because this is a heavy object. In an accident, this could easily kill somebody. Don't muck about with that. Really, really tied down extremely. And we've done two separate brackets here to tie it down securely. So that's a vital part of one of these. Your installation must include a way of tightening it down very, very strongly. But also you want a way that you be able to remove it because that's the beauty of the system. It doesn't have to stay in your vehicle. And as it stands, unlike a battery and cable, loose cables, it's self-contained and absolutely safe. Let's talk a bit about my choice of fridge freezer. I went for a Snowmaster. This is a classic series 57 litre dual door. There's my fridge and there's my freezer. I was asked why Snowmaster? And I'm sure that question came about as a result of their ask. And they asked the question because I think they saw Snowmaster as one of these fridge fridge make fringe fridge makers. Um, that has happened as a result of this upsurge in demand for this style of fridge in the USA. This style of fridge being much more suitable for compact, more sm smaller vehicles. And they're far, far more efficient than the, op the, the tall, you know, open vertical door type fridges. And that's not the case at all. Now, in the market today, most well-known brand, one of them is Dometic. Dometic actually, Chinese uh, manufacturer make products for many different brands for example they make for Waco good brand nothing wrong with it bit heavy on electrical power and the insulation isn't great but it's a good reliable product and it works I've owned one they make for ARB I've owned one Gr very good product well made and it, they work they make for a dozen other branded fridge makers and they and they all have similar uh, performance some better than others though snowmaster is a south african company it's made in china i was one of the early people to to uh, have one in my vehicle i was given one to review and i came up with mostly thumbs up there are a few quality issues here and there and there were a few issues and uh, and I've stuck with them. And when building this truck, I went to the makers and I said, I'd like this model, and they sent me one immediately. Of course they would. But I selected them. They're not, I'm not sponsored by them, and I've never been sponsored by, by Snowmaster. If, if I look at the, manif at the fridge world today in terms of four-wheel drive, there are three makes that stand out as the best you can get. In no particular order, National Lunar, Engel, and Snowmaster. National Lunar, because of quality of manufacture and efficiency, they are extremely high quality product. Engel, they're still so good, despite the fact that they appear to have had very little investment in terms of new products and things over the years. Probably less than the other two. Uh, but they're very good, they're very efficient, and I rate them highly. And Snowmaster. That's a South African company. You can buy them in the US, they have agents in the US, and in Europe, and in Australia, and of course South Africa. And the reason why I like them is because I think of all of them, they are the most innovative. Now this particular one, and it goes the same goes for all of their main fridges, their main 12 volt fridges, it comes with this little remote controller and as you can see there it gives me the temperature of that compartment at one degree that compartment at three degrees and my overall battery battery voltage is 11.8 volts and i can hear the compressor spinning so that's 11.8 volts under load in the morning which means my batteries are still nice and healthy the nice part about this is that 
on a rough road when everything's shaking around, fridges can disconnect themselves, can be unplugged or whatever. It happens, okay? It will warp. The fridge will warn if the voltage gets too low. So if I've got a battery system that's not coping, before it turns off, it will warn the user. Beep, 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 and it will show up the voltage on here. You'll know it's about to switch itself off. It doesn't just turn off. It warns you first. You can set the voltage at which it will turn off here. If this becomes disconnected completely, this little guy beeps and warns you that it doesn't have connection with the fridge. So you get a warning immediately that there's something wrong. I can then set, so now if I want to set my voltage of my top fridge there and make it one volt and then my other fridge, I'm going to drop that to one degree Celsius, not volt. I have now set, reset my fridge. I don't need to go to the, you know, wherever the controls are. The same controls are on the fridge and that's vital. You, if this doesn't exist, if this is, gets lost, it doesn't matter in one iota. You can do all of these controls from the side of the fridge. And this is solar charged. So I just attach that to my windshield and forget about it. I think that this particular model is probably the best value for money fridge freezer available today. The quality has improved no end from the early models. Innovative, and I'm not sponsored. I just think that it's a really, really good, good product. And that's my take on fridges. I've never had this much electrical power in, my, in a car in my entire life. Not even close to it. Um, I don't have a measuring system to measure the, 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 the um, input from the solar panel at this point in time, so I don't know how well the solar panel is working. Um, and the draw systems inside the vehicle are working brilliantly. No squeaks, no rattles, no nothing. Quick Pitch and I work together to design the draw system. And what you're seeing here is actually the very first one that was completed and built into any particular true carrier. Well, we had to start somewhere and uh, mine was the guinea pig vehicle and very happy I am with it too. I chose one large draw here, two shallower drawers and a medium sized drawer with an opening. Now that was my idea of uh, optimum practicality. There is enough space for another one of these drawers over there, but I decided to have an open space because I want to be able to put extra cans of water and strap them down in there. That was my decision. And likewise, that open area there, I wanted it open. I didn't want it with another drawer. Quick Pitch now offer this for troop carriers, and you can decide how many drawers you want and how many open spaces you want. Also, in here is a cavernous cupboard. I have my cooker and there's the water boiler in there. And this is an enormous amount of storage space. And in fact, I've found that the way this is rigged up right now, it's, it has masses of storage space in it. Far more than my previous trip carrier and in fact far more than any other vehicle that I have owned. And it just plain works. It's so easy to access everything. Uh, I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, and this was a design that we decided not to have the, the um, uh, opening all the way because now this stuff can actually stay there. It doesn't get in the way and yet you can still get under there. So again, thinking about practicalities first. There is a very long drawer. That's all our kitchen stuff and other stuff besides. This opening 
uh, table is actually not from Quick Pitch. This is something that I got from an expo in Germany made by a company called Picra for attaching to the back door of troop carriers. Unfortunately though, it does get away, get in the way of the draw. So it's either that or the draw. So because of that, it's not as practical as it might be. But if I had to choose one, I'd choose the draw. A few other things that might interest you what I've added to the troop carrier. Fire extinguishers. I use fire strikers. I have three in the vehicle in front of the two front seats and one in the back. Why I like fire striker is that, well basically what you do is um, to, um, I'm not going to set it off, but uh, you strike that on there and that gives a blast, a very high pressure blast and you point it directly at the base of the fire and fire should go out. They're very effective and the great part about Fire Striker is that you do not need, this is just so the cap doesn't accidentally fall off when the roads rattle, you do not need to have them recharged. Once they're there, they're there. They're maintenance free. And so I know they will always work. This is also quite interesting. This is a camp cover product. It's a South African product and was actually designed for the back door. Although it was a bit long, it was actually designed to pin to the back door. And it turned out to be the absolute perfect size for the back of the troop carrier. And in here, I have my toiletry uh, stuff, spade and uh, toilet paper and things like that. Um, I can't put a lot of stuff in here because I can get my hand in when it's closed to open that. So I don't put a lot of stuff in there. I've just got a knife sharpener and a sponge, uh, insect repellent and basic cooking spices and things like that in there. In here I have uh, this is my open space and I can use it for 101 different things. Uh, snacks I was eating earlier but this here is quite an interesting product. It's a basically it's a it's a commode but it's specifically designed for you to be able to hang um, waste management sachets. So I can leave myself in uh, do a number two in the bush and take everything away with me. No smell, no fuss, no mess. And that fits perfectly in there. And that's why I like this open space in the back of the truck because every trip is a little bit different, isn't it? And so that's what I've, I'm now using that space for in there. This here is a, a gift that was given to me at Overland Expo West. And uh, well, it speaks for itself really. This is a, a mini kitchen. If I'm next to the side of the road and I wanna have a cup of tea, I've got my teas, my sugars, uh, paper towel, uh, little gas, my bo water boiler, kettle and cups, and also my air pump. Uh, not the pump so much as the, uh, as the pipe and uh, they're re all ready for inflating tires quick and easy. Up here I've got my uh, two blades. This one is, um, got to take that off carefully because that is extremely sharp. That's a wood cutting blade and this is a wood sawing blade made by Zabat. So cutting branches and things like that. The radio, GME. Uh, the actual radio itself is actually hidden in the console, doesn't get in the way. And all the controls are on the microphone, including the speaker. You can put an external speaker on it if, if you want to, but um, it's worked extremely well. Very, very pleased with that. I am simply amazed on how much abuse this GME antenna can take. Particularly on the Canning stock route, we hit it sometimes so hard, the clattering inside the vehicle was, and it's, uh, it's hardly got a mark on it. It's really, really, really nicely made. Uh, that's our bracket, similar to GME's bracket, but um, we decided we had these brackets that were designed with our truck, so we decided to use our brackets instead. Very common question. How did the wrap fare with the scratching? In a word, amazing. In fact, the only scratches I can see on the car are on where there is no wrap. 
If you can see here, these faint lines in the plastic coat. But if I look here on the green, I suppose I can just see them if I squint, uh, but I've got to look very closely. Apart from the fact that the wrap looks fantastic, the vehicle is so much easier to clean. It, the dirt doesn't stick to it, it rolls off it. So to clean it is... I know how to clean a car. This is the easiest car in the world to clean. Of course, the next thing to do, I guess, is to show you what's in the drawers. For example, I always travel with my compass. I could show you that. Or I could show you the most world's most amazing pair of scissors. That is just, you know how nice a good pair of scissors is? That there. Or well, what's this box all about? And, and that'll be for another video, I think. And that will also be the perfect time to show you some of the other kit I've since fitted to the truck. Of course, the fact that that is now a usable working surface. I've got about 10,000 kilometres on the truck now. And the Canning stock route, that trip, took up most of it. I'm now on my second trip. Um, what do I not like about the Troop Carrier? I mentioned earlier that in previous videos that I think they're very expensive for what you're getting. It's basically just a, a van. Um, but as I said, great platform for overland truck and it is. It's wonderful. V8 motor, really beautiful. I mean, it performs superbly. I've got not a lot of bad things to say about it. But there are there's one thing, there's one thing that I really don't like on this vehicle at all. And that is the seats. They've improved the seats. The, the new seat is, is, is supposedly better than the previous one. And my previous troop carrier had the, the, uh, the workmates seats. The, it's a very, very basic, it, didn't have the, it had the two split, not the three like the workmate, but it was, they were vinyl. They were the low spec. I was a lot more comfortable in those, believe it or not, than there are these, th this one. I'm getting backache. I'm finding long distance tiring. I have to do something about the seats. There are things that I have tweaked on the vehicle to make better, but most of those are to do with the, the camping and the convenience and the practicality of living out of this vehicle. But in terms of pure driving, the only thing I've really done is the Unichip. I've done nothing else. And the interior console. Yes. I've got to do something about these seats. And there are some really good seat manufacturers out there and I am going to go and find one. And after six months of building, of intense work, intense both joy and frustration in putting the vehicle together and then not being able to take it on any kind of test run. We have found so few issues. So, every issue we found is so easy to sort out, so minor, nothing major. Um, and that's where I'm sitting now. I'm sitting, I'm I, it's, I love it. It's the best truck I've ever built. By a long way. Actually, by a long, long way.